Luke chapter 5, please, if you'll turn there in your Bibles. Uh, Luke chapter 5, we're continuing our verse-by-verse journey through the Gospel of Luke. And uh, this morning we come to verses 1 through 11. Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. And I encourage you uh, to follow along as we read uh, God's Word together. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, uh, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came. And filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything. They left everything. They left everything and followed him. One of the coolest things about visiting Israel is a, a museum located in the ancient town of Gennesaret uh, between Magdala, which is the hometown of Mary Magdalene, and Capernaum. It's located, located on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. What, what's unique about this particular museum is that it contains what has become known as the Jesus Boat. Uh, Those of you who have gone with us to Israel remember this particular museum. We visit on all of our trips. In fact, we're going back in 2024 if anybody would like to come and see it for yourself. This is the Jesus boat. That's what it's called. In 1986, after a dry season when the lake was very low, uh, two brothers found the remains of this boat embedded into the muddy shores of Galilee. Of course, over in Israel... Any discovery like this is dealt with very carefully, especially due to the historical dimensions of that land. In fact, it took 12 days to excavate that particular boat. And after they excavated it through radiocarbon dating, they determined that this boat was dated all the way back to 1st century A.D., the time of Jesus' earthly ministry. They also found inside the boat a few artifacts, artifacts like uh, a cooking pot, hooks, and an oil lamp that also dated back to the exact same time. The, the, The whole thing is extremely cool because it, it fits the description of boats that we read about Here in the Gospels, thus earning the nickname that it has been given, the Jesus boat. Now, here's a pic of what that reconstructed boat would have looked like in the days of Christ, giving us a little bit more clarity of what they were actually sailing on in the Sea of Galilee. Now, let, let me be clear, okay, in case anyone misunderstand what I'm saying, we, we don't know if Jesus was actually on this boat or not, okay? We don't know that for sure. 
But it's really neat to think about, isn't it? Did that boat dating back all the way to first century A.D., did it belong to Peter, James, John, or perhaps his father's business, that is, James and John's his father? Could, could Jesus have actually been on this boat at some point during his earthly life? You say, Pastor, what does all of this have to do with Luke chapter 5? Well, our, our text this morning is centered around some fishermen and their boats. Now, most men like a good fishing story, whether it's exaggerated or not. But the fish tale that we read here in Luke chapter 5 really happened. It actually took place. And it changed the lives of Peter, James, and John. Here's what happened. Let me give you four things as we kind of walk through the text together. Number one, notice with me, the crowd. The crowd, that's verses 1 through 3. Verse 1 tells us that on this particular day, the crowd was, look at it there, pressing in on Jesus. That is, they've, they've literally crowded him. And for what reason? Verse 1 goes on to say that they pressed in on Jesus to hear the word of God. Now, now to me as a preacher of the word, this is, this is incredibly encouraging that crowds of people were coming out, pressing in on Jesus just to hear the word of God taught and preached to them. Of course, that's exactly what Jesus declared in chapter 4 that he was going to do. He stated in verse 43 that he's going to go from town to town in the Galilean region. And what is he going to do? He's going to preach the good news of the kingdom of God. And as he is doing this, crowds of people, crowds of people are coming to hear it. And what begins to unfold here is what you might like to call a beachside service. Now, with our situation outside this morning, that sounds pretty good right now, doesn't it? Can you imagine if we could just kind of lift ourselves up and go down to Myrtle Beach and just kind of sit there in the sand and I could, I could stand over here on a boat in the water and preach to you and you could sip on pina coladas and we just have a wonderful time together. <laughs> we, have a, we, have a, we have a beachside service taking place. It's, it's actually fascinating to me because it gives us something very, very important about Jesus. And that is he was always on mission. Always on mission. No matter where he was, what he was doing, he was always on mission. In the synagogue, he was preaching. In the streets of the cities, he was preaching. Out on the beach, by the lake, he was preaching. In the mountains, on the hillside, he was preaching. He was always on mission. And church family, so ought we to be always on mission. No matter where we are, what our vocation is, what capacity we find our lives in at that particular moment of the day. We ought to always find ourselves on mission. He's not in a synagogue. He's on the beach. But what's he doing on the beach? Preaching the good news of the kingdom of God. And here we see him standing by the Sea of Galilee. Verse 1 calls it the Lake of Gennesaret, which is just another name for it. In fact, the locals called it the Lake of Gennesaret. So he essentially standing here by the Sea of Galilee, has nowhere to go. The crowd is packed in on him so tightly that he can't move. And this is where we're reminded that the nature of Jesus' ministry was both creative and flexible. He was creative and he was flexible. You know, we could learn a lot from Jesus in this regard. The truth is, some of us, including myself, are so stuck in our ways that we don't want anything in us or around us to change or look different. We're comfortable. But we're not only comfortable, the truth is, 
We're stubborn. This is my culture, so this is how I do it, and you're never going to change anything about me. This is my tradition. This is how I've always done it, and you're never going to change that in my life. You see, Jesus' ministry was creative and flexible while many of us are still sitting here comfortable and stubborn. How do we see his creativity and his flexibility? Well, he he sees two boats that had come onto the shore after a night out on the lake. Now, the Bible says that one of the boats belonged to Peter. And so Jesus goes to Peter, and he asked him if he could use his boat. The reason why he does this is because Peter and Jesus are not strangers. If you've been following us in the sequence of our text, you realize that they've already begun a friendship. In fact, they've already shared a meal together in Peter's home. So the Lord comes to his new friend, and he asked his new friend Peter if he could use his boat as a pulpit, which shows us not only was Jesus' ministry creative, and it was flexible, In other words, he didn't just send them home because he was backed up against the water. No, he's thinking through, how can I keep teaching them? How can I keep preaching? I got to do something different. I got to do something I hadn't done before. We 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 got to put them in a different place or whatever. Flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. Jesus was always flexible. He didn't shut the whole thing down that day because they ran out of land. Flexible, whatever we got to do to keep the ministry going. Whatever we got to do to keep the ministry going. But he's not just flexible. He's not just creative. He's purposeful. He's purposeful. And what do I mean by that? In his omniscience, he chose Peter's boat. Now, we don't actually believe that Peter and James and John's boats were the only ones out there. I mean, this is a heavy Heavy fishing district, Galilee is. So of all the boats, of all the boats, he chooses Peter's boat. And he's going to use this precise ministry situation to not only creatively and with flexibility teach the crowd, but he's also going to purposefully do a work in Peter's heart. In fact, it's fascinating to me that Luke doesn't even tell us one moment about what Jesus is actually teaching the crowds. We have no transcript of that sermon like we do the Sermon on the Mount. Luke simply takes the camera lens in my cinematography mind. He takes the camera lens, and now he begins to zoom in on Simon Peter. Now, there's an inlet to the west of Capernaum just near the town of Tabga where the hillside actually slopes into the Sea of Galilee, which provides a, a, a natural amphitheater-like setting. It's, it's, it's very possible that this is where this event took place because notice what Jesus does. Look at verse 3. He gets into the boat, Peter's boat, and he asks Peter to put out a little from the land. And so he sat down on the boat in the water while the people are on this hillside and he preaches to them. He teaches to them. Again, get the, get the picture in your mind. He's in the boat, out from the land, The crowds are gathered on the shore, and Jesus' voice, his teaching voice, his preaching voice, it just carries over the water and into the ears of the people. All right? That's the setting. That's the crowd. But notice with me number two here, the catch, the catch. Look at verse 4. And when he, Jesus, had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep. I, I grew up learning this in the, in the King James. The King James says, launch out into the deep. Launch out into the deep. Put, put out into the deep. This is Jesus telling Peter this. Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. All right, so we have the crowd. We have the catch. Several things are happening here. First, I, I need to remind you, if you're new to the disciples and the Gospels and how the story is unfolding, I, I, I need you to know that Simon Peter is a professional fisherman. This is not a hobby. This is how he earns a living, okay? He's a professional fisherman. This is his expertise. 
Jesus, on the other hand, in his earthly perspective, was a carpenter's kid. That's how he grew up. He's a construction man who's now turned into a teacher. So from Peter's perspective, Jesus has just walked into, by the way, his new friend Jesus, he's not quite sure fully yet who this man is. Jesus, the carpenter, the construction man, just walked into Peter's office, his place of business, and he's telling him, how to do his job. He gets into his boat, his office, says, I want you to go out into the deep water, let down your nets, and when you do, we're going to catch some fish. I think I speak for most men today when I say that we don't respond very well to those outside of our profession telling us how to carry out our profession. There's something within us called ego and pride. So, so for me to go down to Charlotte Douglas Airport tomorrow morning and walk into Alex Drukoff's office where he is the lead engine mechanic for Delta Airlines, I want you to know if you fly Delta Airlines, everything is in the hands of Alex Drukoff. He is responsible for it taking off. He's responsible for it staying there. He's responsible for it landing. And if anything ever happens, he's the one to blame for it, all right? I'm not going to drive down to Charlotte Douglas tomorrow, sit in Alex's office, and tell him how to put that engine together. I'm just glad the thing flies. But it would be awful difficult For Alex to hear me walk into his office and tell him how to do his job. I mean, to be clear, even myself, just to be frank, there is an unprecedented level, an unprecedented level of irritation that swells up inside of me when a non-pastor tells me how to pastor. And at this point, Peter has not yet fully realized who Jesus is. He's tired. That is Peter. Look at what verse 5 says. We've worked all night and caught nothing. Okay? He's tired. Like many of you this this morning, you're tired. You barely keep your eyes open. And my preaching's not helping it at all. He hasn't had a good night at work. He's caught nothing. He's already cleaned up the nets. He's already put away his gear. He knows that if you want to net fish in the Sea of Galilee, you don't go out in the deep water to do it. You do it in the shallow water. And he also knows that of all times during the day to go fishing, you never go in the middle of the day. He's an expert fisherman. But Jesus is not, by his earthly profession, he's not. In fact, Jesus just got in the boat. Peter's been in it all night. Jesus just gets into it. And what he tells Peter to do in terms of his professional work not only goes against the expertise of fishing the Sea of Galilee, but he actually declares to Peter that if he does what I'm telling you to do, it will be successful. If you'll go out into the deep water and let down your nets, you will find a catch. We're going to go let down our nets for a catch. We're not going to go let our nets down and try to catch something. Jesus says we're going to go let our nets down and we're going to catch something. So can we this morning at least sympathize with the fact that Peter's initial response to Christ is probably not that very far removed from where our response might be in this situation? Master, Master, teacher, look, we've been working all night and we didn't catch anything. That's Peter's initial reaction. Jesus says, put out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. Master, teacher, I appreciate you coming today. Glad you can use my boat as a pulpit anytime you want. I just just want you to know, as a professional here, we've been out there all night, the best time of day to catch a fish, and we haven't caught anything. I'm tired, I'm hangry. I just want to go home and go to bed. I think there's some obvious doubt here 
on Peter's part about Jesus' request, right? He's doubting that this is actually going to happen. I also think there's a little bit of resistance to the request due to the demand that the request would put on Peter. Just think about this logistically for just a moment. Remember, he's been working all night. He's tired. He's hungry. He has already cleaned his nets. You say, what's the big deal about that? Well, go out with a seaside fisherman one day, and when you come back in, spend the next two hours cleaning nets with him. He's already cleaned all of his nets. He's already put away all of his gear. And so to get it all back out when he's hungry, tired, and ready to go to be would be an unpleasant chore when he's convinced in his mind, this ain't going to work. But Jesus is working on the inside of Peter, isn't he? And even though his initial response was resistance to the request, he happened to immediately remember the authority by which, is, which, which he had heard Jesus teach in the synagogue. He happened to remember the authority by which he removed that demon during the church service. He happened to remember the authority by which Jesus healed his mother-in-law over dinner the last Sabbath day. And he happened to remember the authority by which he saw all the sicknesses of Capernaum being Healed. So even though his initial reaction was resistance, he immediately follows that up in verse 5 by saying, but. It's all one sequence. I don't think this is going to work. But at your word, Jesus, I'll let down the nets. Now, can I just be fully transparent with you this morning? I appreciate this entire verse, all of it. It would be very easy to park on this one phrase, at your word, let down the nets. At your word, I will let down the nets. And we're, and we're going to get there in a minute. But put it all together because I think where Peter's at is where you and I often find ourselves at. This is obedience mixed with a little bit of doubt. That this is obedience in spite of the demand that Jesus had just put upon him. I see myself in this at times. Lord, I, I, I don't know how this is going to work. But I will trust and obey your word. Jesus, I, I don't know what you want me to do. And what I feel like you want me to do, it's going to cost a lot. It's going to be demanding. But I will obey and trust your word. You see, what a transparent and helpful example this is to us. I mean, is it helping anybody else? Because listen to me. When Jesus speaks, regardless of our doubts, and we have doubts, we see the heaviness of the demands but when Jesus speaks, regardless of the doubts, regardless of the demands, we can always conclude that he will honor his word. That he is worthy of our obedience when we have no idea how this is going to come to fruition. And look what happens, verse 6. And when they had done this, so they, they, they listened, they went out to the deep water they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They, they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and to help them, and they, they came and filled both boats so that the boats began to sink. Now, let me ask you a question. How do you think Peter dropped those nets when they got out into, into the deep water? I mean, just put yourself there for a moment. Did he do it passively? And this carpenter's coming here and telling me how to catch fish. Did they do it passively? Was he so beat down? I, 
I don't think initially if we were there we would see any type of eagerness on Peter's part to do this. And if that was the case, if that was the case, it didn't take long for Peter to be awakened with greater alertness than a cup of Starbucks coffee could do for some of you this morning. All of a sudden, when the nets were dropped, they were filled to capacity. The professionals who were struggling to do the job are now struggling to get it all in. And the boats were overflowing with this gigantic load. Now, we've pictured Peter. How do you picture Jesus? Let me tell you how I picture him. Maybe not the same way you do. This is how my mind works. I picture Jesus sitting at the back of the boat, smiling and laughing. <laughs> These tired fishermen are suddenly filled with the joy of the catch. A day of success like they've never experienced in all their years of professional work. You see, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus saw, or Peter saw Jesus' authority through his teaching. He saw his authority over the spirit world. He saw his authority over disease and sickness. And now, Peter sees Jesus' authority over nature. Oh, and by the way, it was in the deep water. It was in the middle of the day. Which reminds us that Jesus doesn't need your or my circumstances to be right in order for him to display his power. All he needs is faith and obedience. Even if it's mixed with a little bit of doubt. All Jesus wants is the faith of the grain of a mustard seed. Just a little bit. Sure, you might have some doubts. The demands might be heavy, but if you will at his word trust him and at his word obey him when you can't explain it, when you can't figure it out, when the circumstances feel incredibly arguous, you can at least, at least realize my God knows what he's doing and he can solve this problem. That's the catch. Crowd number three, the confession. Here's the confession, verses eight and nine. When Simon Peter saw it, when he saw everything's happened, notice what he did. He fell down at Jesus' knees. We've not seen this before. Remember, Jesus is doing a work in Peter's heart. We may think this is about the crowd out there on the shore or the fish in the sea. No, this is about Peter's heart. It's about Peter's heart. Peter falls down at Jesus' knees, and what does he say? Depart from me. He's telling Jesus this. Go, go away, please. I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. Now again, we've already noted that this was not Peter's first interaction with Jesus. However, this interaction was different from any others he has, he's had. Because look, look, Jesus did to Peter what he does to every single one of us. He invaded Peter's life. Jesus invaded Peter's life. So, so, some, are, some of you are right there this morning. You thought one Sunday morning a couple of years ago or a couple of months ago or maybe just a few weeks ago that I would just randomly and just kind of go to church on a Sunday, no big deal, just add this to the other things that I do in my life. You think this is just no big deal. You just randomly came to church and all of a sudden, three weeks later, three months later, Two years later, you have realized, man, this was more than going to church on Sunday morning. The man Jesus has absolutely invaded my entire life. I think about it. I can't sleep. I'm under conviction. Everywhere I turn, I'm thinking about what the messages are and, and, the, and the music. I mean, he's invaded every part of my life, and he does this in a unique and personal way. Think about it. This was Peter's place of work. This was Peter's boat. This was Peter's nets. And when you put this interaction together with the other scenes that Peter observed in Jesus, we see the proverbial light come on, don't we? His eyes were opened. His soul was awakened. When Peter fell down in this outburst of emotion, he was overwhelmed by what he had been experienced since his friendship with Jesus began. For the first time, he really began to understand that I am 
I'm in the presence of God. Which is why he says, verse 8, depart from me. I am a sinful man, O Lord. So let's break down that statement real quickly and we'll go to the final point. One, he calls Jesus Lord. Before the catch, look at it there in your Bibles. Look at verse 5. Before the catch, what did he call him? Master. Which is just a respectable name for teacher. It'd be like those of you who call me pastor. There's no divinity or reverence in that. It's just you respect the position. We, we, always, we always raise our kids to, to, to call the uh, leaders of the brother and sister so-and-so. Or, and when they spoke to another preacher, it's pastor something. Not first names and things like that. Some of you still do that to me. That's great. Whatever. Whatever you do. Don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not preaching at you. I'm just saying that's, that's the term master here. It's a respectable thing. Okay? It's not allegiance necessarily. Master in verse 5, after the catch, what does he say? Lord. <laughs> Lord. He actually understood who Jesus really was. He's not just a teacher. He's not just a good man. He's not just a Johnny come lately doing all these miracles. No, no. This is the sovereign Lord. This is God in the flesh. Peter acknowledges him as Lord. And then he declared himself to be a sinful man. So follow this. He became aware of who Jesus really was, and then he became aware of who he really was. That's how it works. When you become aware of who Jesus really is, you actually start to see who you really are. And look at his confession. It's not so much about the things he did wrong. It was a confession of who he was. He didn't say, I've done some bad things. Depart from me, Lord. No. He said, depart from me, Lord. I am a sinner. Herein lies the distinction between those of you who have truly come to Christ and those of you who this morning are standing outside of true faith in Christ. The one who has truly come to faith in Christ in this room this morning acknowledges that he doesn't just do bad things from time to time. He actually acknowledges that in essence he is an unholy person. He is a sinner. And it's because of that that we act out in unpleasant ways. What we see here is Peter being humbled and broken at the presence of God. He's aware that at that moment he was in the very presence of perfection. He's in the presence of of holiness. It's the same response that Isaiah gave in Isaiah chapter 6. He looked up and he saw the beauty of the holiness of God. And what did he immediately declare? Woe is me. I am lost. I am undone. I am unclean. When Job's eyes in Job 42 saw the Lord, Job said, I despise myself. I repent in dust and ashes. Now Peter realizes this is God. And God is holy. And God is perfect. And I am not. And he is broken and humbled by who he has met. You see, there's an inner agony over sin that takes place as a necessary prelude before the saving grace of Jesus comes into our lives. Peter's doing just that. He's mourning over who he knew himself to be compared to the holiness of Jesus. And then, and then just briefly, he asked Jesus to leave him. He asked Jesus to leave him. So, so, so okay, don't, don't be too hard on Peter here. The seed of spiritual life is just now being birthed in his heart. He's as fresh as fresh can be at this moment when it comes to his relationship with Jesus. So, so let's not get too hard on him. Let's not judge him, condemn him for asking Jesus to go away. This was a novice expression of someone who has seen how sinful they are and they feel like they are absolutely unworthy to be anywhere near the holiness of God. That's all that it is. He's, he's not rejecting Jesus, rebelling against him, or not wanting to have a relationship with him. This is a novice expression. Listen, I, I'm separated from this God. I can't be anywhere near him compared to who I am. But as Peter's faith grows... From this point forward, he will come to realize 
The ever-present awareness of our sin actually drives us to Jesus and not away from him. Do you remember John 21 after Jesus' death and resurrection? Peter was in a boat trying to fish. He had nearly given up. And he's distracted, sorely distracted, by the reality that he had just failed the Lord in that particular season of his life. But then a voice from the shore rang out. Do you remember that? A voice from the shore rang out across the water to this boat where Peter is on. He said, hey, fishermen, try the other side. Cast your net on the other side. And what happened? He did. The net was overwhelmingly filled with fish. Peter had seen this before. And he knew at that moment that it was the Lord standing on the shore giving out that command. He cried out, it is the Lord. At the same time, he jumped out of the boat. He swam as fast as he could to Jesus. What did he learn? He learned that the more we know about Jesus and the more we learn about ourselves, the more we will run to him. Finally, number four, the call, the call, the call. That was his confession. Here's the call. So again, follow the sequence. Peter's confessing his sin. He's acknowledging Jesus as Lord. He's asking Jesus to go away. But then Jesus said to Peter in verse 10, do not be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. I wrote down these three things. Number one, you don't have to be afraid of Christ when your faith is in Christ. Don't be afraid, Jesus said to Peter. When we're in the presence of God, we have nothing to fear. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Why? Because you are free in Christ. But when we live our lives outside the presence of God, we have everything to fear. Including the Lord himself. Jesus said to Peter, don't be afraid. Why? Because you don't have to be afraid of Christ when your faith is in Christ. I wrote down this statement, number two, new life in Christ brings a present and future transformation. New life in Christ brings both a future and present transformation. I love the next three words of verse 10. He tells him not to be afraid, and then he says, from now on. If I had an eloquent singing voice, I would break out into the greatest showman song. From now on, these eyes will not be blinded by the dark. You know. From now on. You want to join me? Let's go. My, no, I'm not kidding. Still one of the best. From now on, Jesus says. Peter, I know you're a sinner. I know it. But from now on, you're going to be known as my child. Peter, I know you have a lot of past regrets. But from now on, you're going to live in my grace. Peter, I know you've been wrapped up in yourself. But from now on, I'm going to teach you how to wrap up your life in me. Peter, from now on, from now on, from now on, everything is going to be different. Oh, please listen to me, friend. You cannot change the past, but what you can do is from now on, let Jesus change your future. From now on, Peter, things are going to be different. I know some of you are sitting together in tense marriages, you, you have children, that the, the relationship is just, it's just off, and it, there's some private personal sin that nobody else knows about. Maybe you're here, you're overwhelmed by the burden. There, there is the guilt of being in the presence of a holy God and realizing how different you are from him. But God is saying to you this morning, if you'll just come to me in faith, from now on, from now on, it'll be different. And then I wrote down, Jesus, Jesus doesn't flee from sinners, but he seeks them out. He gives them grace and he calls them to join him. He doesn't flee from sinners. He seeks them out. He gives them grace and he calls them to join him. He says, from now on, you will be catching men. You see, as a part of Peter's now on moment, it involved a unique call on his life. 
It was a call to leave his present vocation of filling nets with dead fish and to fill gospel nets with living souls. Of course, the spiritual fulfillment of that will be in Acts chapter 2, right? When Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and he preaches that magnificent message and Thousands come to faith in Christ. The spiritual gospel nets that Peter had learned to cast out by the training and discipleship of the Lord is going to reap a whirlwind of fruit by which you and I even today are recipients of. You see, catching men is a description of gospel ministry. Our, our law enforcement in the room may look at catching men a little bit differently, uh, but actually there, there's a gospel implication of this. This call is given to all who confess Jesus as Lord. Look right here. This call to catch men and women is given to all who confess Jesus as Lord, regardless of our vocation. God has called each one of us as his children to devote our lives to the catching of men and women with the gospel of Christ. So in whatever capacity we find ourselves in throughout our day, we are to be motivated in all things and above all things by the call of God to catch others with the gospel. I'm a countant behind the desk. I'm also a fisher of men. I'm a coach on a ball field. I'm also casting the net of the gospel. I'm driving a truck, delivering goods. I'm also, I'm also a preacher of the gospel. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, but I'm a gospel. We've got to help some of you with that, but it, but it can happen. I, I'm, I'm a medical professional, but I'm also a spreader of the gospel. No matter what our vocation is. God specifically, Jesus specifically wanted Peter to leave it all behind. Leave it all behind. He may not be asking you to leave your profession, but he is asking all of us to spread the gospel. To catch, to catch men and women with the truth of Jesus. In verse 11, here it is. Finally, I know you're thinking. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. I've been captivated by that phrase all week in my study. They left everything. Now, what did that mean immediately? It meant they left the catch. What do you think they did with it? Catch and release, pastor, that's what they did with it. No, I think maybe in an unrecorded portion of what we have in the scriptures, maybe all those people on the hillside had a nice little lunch that afternoon. Anybody loves some fish sticks and some tartar sauce on a sunny afternoon? But they left it behind. No money for the catch. They left the family business. All they've ever known. In fact, this was the greatest moment of success in their entire professional career. And they left. They left. At the height of success, they walked out the door. Why? Because they saw something they never saw before. They saw the glory of God. They saw the grace of God. They saw God's love for people. And guess what? Suddenly, Fishing wasn't all that important anymore. Fishing went from number one to a little bit lower on the list. They left everything and they followed him. And I put here emphasis on the fact that they followed him. Jesus. They didn't follow a new business model. They didn't follow a new philosophy. They didn't even follow a systematic theology. They followed the Son of God, Jesus. I'll give you two things to reflect on. One, following Jesus is not just one part of our lives. It is our life. He invades every part of it. 
But there may be some people in this room this morning who treat him like a file among other files. I got, I got, I got my family file. I got my job, job file. I got my hobby file. And, and now there's my Jesus file. And, I, and I'm putting everything right in the place where it needs to be. You know, I got this here and this here. And so, so what do we do? We look at Jesus as if he's just one file of a lot of different files in our life. Let me tell you something. He's not just one file. He's the whole cabinet. He's the whole cabinet. Or in computer terms for the younger generation, he's the whole folder. <laughs> Jesus is the folder. Now, now I find out where my family fits in light of Jesus. I find out where my career fits in light of Jesus. I find out where my finances fit in light of Jesus. I, I find out where my temptations fit in light of Jesus. He's not just one part. He's invaded every part of my life. And that's what it means to follow him. Following him with everything because he is everything. And then let me say to you, that Jesus has not come to drive sinners away from his holy presence, but to draw them into the net of his embracing grace. Ray Ortland said this past week, if Jesus did not come to the condemn the world, I doubt that he wants you to do the same. But our minds are programmed to think that God has come in this time and manifestation to just judge. Look, judgment is coming. Condemnation is coming. But not right now. What's come now is the gospel net. And he's wanting you to come into the net of his love and his mercy and his grace. You see, it's his holiness that does not condemn us. It's his holiness that humbles us and breaks us. But then his grace takes us up into his arms and puts the pieces back together in a beautiful image that reflects the glory of his grace. Oh, if we could just leave with those two, three, two, two things, life would be different. He's not just one part. He is all of it. And he didn't come to push me away. He came to draw me in. I'm reminded of the old hymn we often, often sang as a kid during our times of response. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is called. He's calling. The question is, will you leave everything and follow him? Let's stand together for prayer.